In this video, we take a look at how you implement Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. So this is the first algorithm where the exam board require you to know a little bit less, that you still need to understand the main steps, the prerequisites, you should be able to apply the algorithm to a data set, you should be able to identify if given its code, and you should be able to read and trace it but you are not expected to be able to write the code for this algorithm under exam conditions. Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm finds the shortest path between one node and all other nodes on a weighted graph. It is sometimes considered a special case of the A star algorithm with no heuristics. Although Dijkstra actually developed his algorithm first, it is also a type of breadth first search. A limitation of Dijkstra's shortest path is that it doesn't work for edges with a negative weight value. The Bellman Ford algorithm later provided a solution to that problem, but it's beyond the specification. Dijkstra developed this algorithm to find the shortest route of travel between Rotterdam and Groningen. It can be used for many purposes where the shortest path between two points needs to be established. For example, GPS navigation, IP routing, telephone networking. As we've already mentioned, Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm will find the shortest path between a specified start node and all the other nodes in a weighted graph. This is similar to a breadth first search, which we learned about in a previous video. We're going to use a table pre-populated with nodes or vertices A through G to help us work through this algorithm. The use of a table or array is just one approach to implementing Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. You could just as easily do this with a queue structure and a series of lists. We're going to use this table to help us work out the shortest path from A to all other nodes. Before we start, you will notice we've pre-populated the table with some additional data. We've indicated that no nodes have been visited as of yet. We also need to set an initial starting distance for each of the nodes. This initial number should be very large. The reason for that will become clear as we work through the algorithm. Here we've used infinity as the default starting number. Note that the shortest distance from the starting node A to itself is, of course, zero. So here are the steps presented in simple structured English that we will now follow to calculate the shortest path from the starting node A to all other nodes. It's separated into two parts. The first shown in yellow calculates the shortest path from a specified node to all others. And the second part shown in red outputs the shortest path from the start node to a specified goal node. So we start by finding the node with the shortest distance from the start that has not yet been visited. Well, that is node A, which has a distance from the start of zero, whereas all the others are currently infinity. We now need to consider each connected node that has not been visited. Well, the connected nodes to A that have not yet been visited are B, C and D. Let's look at B first. We need to calculate its distance from the start, which is equals to A's distance from the start plus the edge weight. So that's 0 plus 4. So 0 plus 4 is 4. We now check if B's distance from the start is lower than its current recorded distance. Well, four is clearly less than infinity, so we have to carry out two actions because that's true. We update B's distance from the start to the newly calculated distance of four, and we set the previous node column to the current node A. So we've got to be from A. Next, we do the same thing for nodes C and D. Remember, each node's distance from the start is equals to A's distance from the start 
plus their edge weights. So we have 0 plus 3 is 3, 0 plus 2 is 2. 3 and 2 are both less than infinity, so we update C and D's distance from the start, and we set their previous nodes to A as well. We're now finished with node A, so we mark it as visited. Once again, we go back to the top and we find the node with the shortest distance from the start that has not yet been visited. Well, that's D. It has a distance from start of two. Then we consider each node connected to D that we have not yet visited. So in this case, that's C and F. This time, each node's distance from the start will be equal to D's distance from the start plus their edge weight. So C would be two, because that's D's distance from the start, plus C's edge weight of one, two plus one is three. The newly calculated distance from the start is not less than the current recorded distance from the start. So this time, we don't make any changes to the table. So we're going to consider node F now. So that's D's distance from the start of two plus the edge value of two, two plus two is four. And the current distance from start for F is infinity. So four is obviously less than infinity. So we update nodes F's distance from the start. And also note that the previous node visited was D. We're now finished with node D, so we mark it as visited. Once again, we find the node with the shortest distance from the start, which has not yet been visited, and that's node C. We consider each node connected to C that has not been visited. Well, there are none, so we simply mark this node as visited. So now the node with the shortest distance from the start that has not yet been visited is either B or F. They both have a distance from the start of four. So we're just going to choose B. We could have chosen F instead. It doesn't matter which one you choose. It all comes down to how the algorithm is implemented. We consider each node connected to B that's not being visited. Well, that's just E. E's distance from start becomes four, the current distance from the start for B, plus its edge value of four. Four plus four is eight. 8 is less than the value we're currently storing for E of infinity. So we update the node's E's distance from start and also note the previous node we came from, node B. We're finished with node B, so we mark it as visited. Find the node with the shortest distance from the start that's not been visited. Well, that's F with 4. We consider each node connected to F that hasn't been visited. That's just G. G's distance from start is 4, which is F's distance, plus the edge of 5. 4 plus 5 is 9. 9 is less than the value we're currently storing of infinity. So we update the node G's distance from start and also the fact that we've come from F to get here. We're now done with node F, so we mark it as visited. We find the node with the shortest distance from the start, which has not yet been visited. That's E with a value of 8. We consider each node connected to E that's not being visited, and that's just G. So we've got the value of 8, which is E's distance from start, plus the edge value of 2. 8 plus 2 is 10. Now note this newly calculated distance from the start is not less than the current value we have recorded. The current value we have recorded for node G is 9. So we don't do any update at this stage. We're now finished with node E, so we mark it as visited. Find the node with the shortest distance, which hasn't been visited, well that's just G. Consider each node connected to G that's not been visited. Well, there aren't any, so we simply mark this node as visited. As there are no unvisited nodes left, the algorithm is complete. To find the shortest path from one node to any other, we start with the goal node 
and follow the previous nodes back to the start, inserting the new node at the front of the list. So for example, the shortest path from A to G is A, D to F to G. Let's consider a practical application of this algorithm. Here's an abstraction of a map of the county of Gloucestershire with some of its towns shown. Say we're trying to travel between Tewkesbury and Stroud in the shortest possible time. Which route should we take? Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm will answer that question for us. We'd need to store the relevant information in a graph data structure. Each town would become a node and the routes between the nodes would become the edges. The distance between each node would become the edge weightings. Using abstraction, we can ignore the actual geography of the roads. Indeed, we can do away with the map completely. All we need to consider for the algorithm is the nodes, the edges, the weightings and how they're connected to each other. Just before we work through the second example, let's look at some pseudocode for one possible implementation of Dijkstra's shortest path. If you pause the video and carefully study the pseudocode, you can see a clear match to the structured English. This could be implemented in any language you chose. And although you are not required to write the code for this algorithm, you are expected to be able to understand and trace it. OK, so let's work through this more practical example. We start by initialising the distance from the start value of all nodes to infinity, except the starting node, which we set to zero. We start with node T, as it has the shortest distance from the start out of all unvisited nodes. Pause the video and see if you can work out the state of the table or the array after the steps highlighted in yellow have been carried out. Unpause the video when you're ready to check your answer. OK, so how did you do? The nodes connected to T that have not yet been visited are G and C. Here, the distance from the start will be equal to T's distance from the start plus the edge weight. So for G, that will be 13 and for F, that will be 9. 13 and 9 are both less than infinity, so we update G and F's distance from start and their previous node values. Which node would we go to next? Well, node C would be next, as it has the shortest distance from the start of all the remaining unvisited nodes, 9. Pause the video again and work out the state of this table after the steps highlighted in yellow have been carried out. Unpause to check your answer. So the nodes connected to C that have not yet been visited are G, S and I. Here the distance from the start will be equal to C's distance from the start plus the edge weightings. So we're going to end up with 17, 23 and 24. Now in the case of node G, 17 is not less than the currently recorded value of 13, so no updates required. 23 and 24 for S and I are both less than infinity, so we update those entry in the tables and indicate that we've come from the previous node C. OK, so which node would we go to next? Node G would be next, as it has the shortest distance from the start of all the remaining unvisited nodes of 13. Once again, pause the video, see if you can work out what this table will look like and unpause it to check your answer. The nodes connected to G that have not yet been visited are B and S. So here the distance from the start will be equal to G's distance from the start of 13 plus the edge weightings. So for B that's 30 and for S that's 23. 30 is less than infinity, so we're going to update node B. But in the case of node S, 23 is the distance from the start value that we already have recorded. So there's no update required there. 
OK, so which node do we go to next? Node S would be next. It has the shortest distance from the start of all the remaining unvisited nodes at a value of 23. Once again, pause the video and unpause to check your answer. The nodes connected to S that have not been visited are B and I. So here, the distance from the start will be equal to S's distance from the start of 23 plus the various edge values. So B is going up with 37 and I with 38. Uh, in the case of node B, 37 is greater than the current value we're storing with 30, so no update required. And in the same way, 38 is greater than the 24 that we're storing, so no need to update node I. So which node do we go to next? So node I would be next. It has the shortest distance from the start of remaining unvisited nodes at 24. So pause the video again and work out what the answer should be. Well, I has no nodes connected to it that haven't already been visited. So we simply mark it as visited and move on. We can see that B will be the final unvisited node. As before, with I, B has no nodes connected to it that haven't already been visited, so we mark it as visited and move on. And as there are no more unvisited nodes, we know the algorithm must be complete. So using this data, can you answer the original question? What is the shortest path between Tewkesbury and Stroud? Pause the video and work out your answer. So to find the shortest path, we start with the goal node, Stroud, and follow the previous nodes back to the start, Tewkesbury, inserting the new node at the front of the list. So the shortest route from Tewkesbury to Stroud is Tewkesbury, Cheltenham, Stroud. So let's consider a couple of final thoughts for Dijkstra's shortest path. You might have spotted that the shortest path we identified during the walkthrough, T to C to S, had a distance of 23. There's an alternative but equally valid shortest path that also has a distance of 23 from T to G to S. And if there happens to be more than one shortest path, the algorithm will just show you one possible route. Now, you already understand that we need to set the initial distance from the start values to a very large number. In our case, we chose infinity. But how do you actually set infinity in a program language? As ironic as it may seem, infinity is defined as an undefined number that can either be a positive or negative number in value. The concept of representing infinity as an integer violates its very definition. And as of 2020, there is no way to represent infinity as an integer in any programming language. What you really need is simply a very large number that you can be sure will always be bigger than any possible edge value. As Python is a dynamic language, Float values can be used to represent an infinite number. You can use float brackets, quotes, inf quotes brackets to represent infinity. The highlighted line of code creates a positive infinity. As a side note, infinite uh, infinity can be both positive and negative. So Python supports both inf and minus inf. Visual Basic uses a different approach and we just assign the largest possible number that can be stored in a sign 32 bit or four byte integer to a constant called infinity. Having watched this video, you should be able to answer the following key question. Do you understand how Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm works and can you trace its code to explain how it works? We know that getting to grips with data structures and all the algorithms associated with them is a very tricky area of the course. And so we've produced a book called Essential Algorithms for A-Level Computer Science that's available on Amazon. 
It covers all the data structures you need to know about, along with the algorithms you need to perform on them, and it covers all the exam boards. We overview each data structure, discussing its typical applications and the operations you can perform on it. We provide a QR code that jumps off to a useful page of additional resources. We then take each data structure and the algorithms you need to perform and present them first in simple structured English, then in a diagrammatic format, then in pseudocode, and finally, we present you with fully coded algorithms which you need to cover on the data structures in both Python and VB, so you can actually code them up and practice them yourselves.